Zeros Racing could be downsizing and selling one of their charters for 2025, and Junior Motorsports is one of the teams that could be picking up that charter and joining the Cup Series. What's going on, guys? It's Daniel, and welcome back to the video. We got some NASCAR and other motorsports story discussed today on the channel. Let's go ahead and just show them channels really quickly. We're first going to take a look at a ton of paint schemes that have been revealed over the course of the last couple of days. Let's go ahead and just jump straight into them. The first paint scheme we're taking a look at is Noah Grayson's 2024 Overstock scheme that we're going to see this weekend at Martinsville. This scheme looks really good in my opinion, very similar to Josh Berry's scheme that we saw a few weekends ago at Circuit of the Americas. I think it looks pretty good. Looking forward to seeing on the racetrack this weekend at Martinsville. The next paint scheme we're taking a look at is Cole Custer's 2024 Haas Night Scheme that we're going to see this weekend at Martinsville. I like the black. I think the colors look really, really great on it. I think Sue Ross Racing did a really solid and great job on this paint scheme. The next paint scheme we're taking a look at is Karsten Quaffle's 2024 Chevy Truck Season Scheme that we're going to see this weekend in his season debut or his Xfinity debut at Martinsville. I like the scheme quite a bit. I like the yellow number. I like the red. I like the logos. I think they did a really good job on this paint scheme. Simple, but looks really good. The next paint scheme we're taking a look at is Todd Gillen's 2024 Carson Newman University scheme that we're going to see this weekend at Martinsville. The scheme's okay in my opinion, nothing too special about it. I think Frumbrose had some good paint schemes, they've also had some not so great paint schemes. Maybe Todd Gillen can have a good run with this scheme. The next paint scheme we're taking a look at is Ricky Sandhouse Jr.'s 2024 Sunny D scheme that we're going to see this weekend at Martinsville. I always like Sunny D schemes that Ricky Sandhouse Jr. has. This one's no exception. Glad to see her still working with Sandhouse in 2024. I think this one looks pretty good. The next paint scheme we're taking a look at is Zane Smith's 2024 Speedy Cash scheme that we're going to see next weekend at Texas. This scheme is okay in my opinion. I've never been a massive fan of the Speedy Cash scheme. It's kind of like a green apple-ish color. They're not absolutely amazing in my opinion. We'll see if Zane Smith can have a good run though that weekend. The next paint scheme we're taking a look at is John Hunter Nemechek's 2024 Skip Barber Racing School scheme that we're going to see this weekend at Martinsville. I think the scheme looks pretty good in my opinion. I like the colors on it and really awesome and glad to see the Skip Barber Racing School will be working with John Hunter Nemechek this weekend. And the final paint scheme we're taking a look at is Christopher Bell's 2024 Yahoo scheme that we're going to see this weekend at Martinsville. This scheme is completely purple, and it's pretty simplistic. I like the Yahoo. I do like the purple. I think it looks pretty decent. Hopefully, we'll see him have a good run with the scheme. Maybe Bell could get his second win of 2024 this weekend. We'll see what ends up happening, see if he can have a good run this weekend with that paint scheme. And now we're going to head on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about the Xfinity Series race at Dover. As they have a title sponsor for the weekend, it is going to be called the Bet Rivers 200. I believe it's the first time that Bet Rivers has sponsored a NASCAR race, and that's really cool to see the Xfinity Series race will be called that. So betting, of course, becoming a big thing in the United States. It's pretty cool to see that Bet Rivers will be working with them. Pretty awesome stuff. Congratulations to them on getting Bet Rivers to sponsor. The NASCAR Xfinity Series race, really awesome stuff and pretty good stuff overall, in my honest opinion. And now we're going to head on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Lucas Oil. As it was confirmed a couple days ago that Lucas Oil will sponsor Kyle Busch for three races in 2024. They're going to sponsor him this weekend at Marzel. Then they're going to sponsor him at Talladega later this year on October 6th. And there's another race that they're going to sponsor, I think, at Michigan, if I'm not mistaken. Lucas Oil has had a long-term partnership and alliance with Rich Schultz Racing for many years. And they also sponsor Kyle Busch's first win in the NASCAR Cup Series with RCR at Auto Club last season. Really cool to see Lucas Oil upping how much they're going to sponsor. I think they sponsored three or four races last year, so I'm not how many they are sponsoring Kyle Busch this year. Pretty cool to see Lucas Oil is going to sponsor Kyle Busch for a few races, and glad to see they're still working with RCR going forward into the future. And now we're going to head on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Connor Zillich. Now, there's an article that came out, I think, from Auto Week and Deb Williams that Connor Zillich calls F1 makes NASCAR look like the county fair. Now, Connor Zillich cleared up a lot of it is stuff, and he says that the, it's talking about the hospitality and the fan experience. He's not talking about the racing. He's talking about the hospitality and the fan experience. Now, obviously, Formula One, they've got a lot more that you can do at a racetrack, and I think Connor Zillich is not wrong. NASCAR still has a lot of stuff they need to work on when it comes to hospitality and the fan experience because there's not as much stuff at a lot of these racetracks but obviously with it being shorter weekends that's one of the reasons why you don't see as much stuff at these racetracks. I think that's a pretty major massive reason why that ends up taking place where you don't see as much stuff showing up at these racetracks. I know the article is definitely a little quick 
clickbaity for sure. But still, I think overall that he's not entirely wrong when it comes to the hospitality side of things. There's not as much at these racetracks, and there definitely needs to be work done on that front. I think NASCAR definitely is going to work on that going forward in the future, and I think they absolutely will do the best to make sure that everything goes well and perfectly in the not-so-distance future. So he's not entirely wrong. I know Connor's trying to get in the sport. He hasn't been in an F1 race in a long time. He's had, I think, a few years. I know some people were trying to say what he was completely wrong for that, but he's not entirely wrong when it comes to that hospitality and fan experience. He is not entirely wrong on that front. And now we're going to head to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Stephen Malazzi. As it was announced on Monday that Stephen Malazzi will drive the 22 for the Ram Brothers Racing this weekend at Martinsville. This will be the first time Stephen Malazzi has raced in the Truck Series this season. Last year he made select starts in the 33 and the 34 truck for the Ram Brothers. And now he'll get the chance to opportunity to make his first start of 2024. There's obviously only 33 trucks entered this weekend so he likely might get his best career Truck Series finish up to this point. I think the goals are trying to finish in the top 25. Those trucks have shown quite a bit this year. They haven't really had the pace and speed. I know Loss had some good performances with the team this year for their standards, but I'm not expecting Steven to set the world on fire. Nonetheless, it's a really great opportunity for him, and glad to see he's getting the chance and opportunity to race with the Ram Brothers this weekend. I know he's been planning to make some starts this year in NASCAR. He's been working on some deals. Glad to see him getting the chance and opportunity to work with them in 2024. And now we're going to head on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Blake Lothian. As it was announced yesterday, Blake Lothian will be driving the 20 for Young's Motorsports this weekend at Martinsville. Blake Lothian made select starts last year with Young's Motorsports in the 20, and I think maybe the 12 truck as well. Last year, actually, Spencer Boyd drove that truck full time. But Blake Lothian made select starts with Young's Motorsports last year in 2023, and I think he had some not great performances, unfortunately. But Young's Motorsports obviously has a lot of focus in their Xfinity Series program, so obviously they haven't ran the 20 or the 12 pretty much all year. Mason Massey, of course, driving full time with the team. But Blake Lothian's getting a really good chance and opportunity. He's got some late model experience and also does have some experience racing at this track as well i really hope he can definitely make the best out of it and hopefully he can have a really strong run this weekend with young's motorsports i'm not expecting him to set the world on fire if he finishes and the race i think that's going to be a good step in the right direction and maybe that could lead him making more starts in the future with young's motorsports and now we're going to head to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about David Starr. As it was announced last night that David Starr will be driving the 66 car for NBA Motorsports this weekend at Martinsville. I have thought there had been a chance possibly that a driver like Matty D or Haley Deegan could drive in this car, but David Starr makes a lot of sense. He's driven for NBA Motorsports many times in the past, and he's obviously got another race schedule with the team, that being the Coca-Cola 600. NBA Motorsports is expected to run around 10 to 12 races this year in 2024, and again, David Starr has driven for this team many times in the past. I'm not expecting him to set the world on fire. Unfortunately, I expect him to probably finish near the back of the pack, probably around 35th to 36th place because we might have some cars that fall out of the race because while Marzo hasn't been the most exciting race in the last couple of years, it certainly do think there might be some chaos near the end of these races. We'll see how things go. It's a great opportunity for him, though, and I really hope that David Starr can't have a solid and good performance with NBA Motorsports this week in Marzo. We'll see how they end up doing this weekend at Martinsville Speedway. And now we're going to head on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Mason Massey. As Mason Massey has won the fan control vote, he will be driving the 14 car for SS Greenlight Racing at Talladega. The last year or so, they've been doing this fan control experience. I think they did it last year at home San Miami Speedway or another track that I can't remember. And I think J.J. Yelly was the driver who won that fan vote car last year. And apparently a lot of J.J. Yelly fans were really mad at Mason Massey for getting it over J.J. But Mason Massey, of course, is driving full-time in the Truck Series this year with Young's Motorsports. Now, I believe that Mason has driven for SS Greenlight Racing in the past. I think he drove for them for a lot of races last year in 2023. So it's not a massive shock or surprise to see that he is getting the chance and opportunity to drive for this team once again. My expectations are is that just survived the big one and just have a really good performance. It's a great opportunity for him, and I really hope he can definitely make the best out of it this that weekend at Talladega, which is only a couple weeks away, which is really, really exciting. We'll see how Mason Massey does. A good opportunity for him. Congratulations to him to get the chance and opportunity to drive for this team at Talladega. Hopefully he can run really good with that team at Talladega Super Speedway. 
And now we're going to head to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Maya Snyder. As it was announced yesterday that Maya Snyder will be driving to 07 for SS Greenlight Racing this weekend at Martinsville. This is going to be the first start that Maya Snyder's had in 2024 as Maya Snyder's been busy and focusing on other things. And Maya Snyder does not bring as much funding and sponsorship as other drivers, which is why he's currently not full-time at this moment. He's had other partnerships with other companies like Louisiana Hot sauce in the past but obviously that sponsorship had fallen through and that's why he's getting now the chance to drive for ss Greenlight racing now what are my realistic expectations for Maya? realistically i think Maya is going to get the best out of the equipment i don't expect him to go out there and contend for the win but i do think he's got a chance and opportunity to maybe finish inside the top 20 or top 25 there's obviously no one going home this weekend, so he won't have any issues making it into the field this weekend at Marsville for the Xfinity Series. But I think he definitely wants to have a really solid and strong performance with the team. We'll see how he ends up doing, but again, it's a really good opportunity for him. And again, I really hope he does end up making the best out of it with the organization and team. Nonetheless, congratulations on the opportunity, my center, and hope he can have a good run with SS Greenlight Racing because I think it'd be really good for the sport if he can have a good run this weekend at Martinsville Speedway. And now we're going to head on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Matt the Benedetto. Now, last time Matt the Benedetto put out a video and tweet on Instagram and Twitter speaking on his first race with Viking Motorsports and reflected on his performance with Viking Motorsports at Richmond. Matt the Benedetto is scheduled to run four more races currently at the moment with Viking Motorsports, and he could run more races in the future. Matty D had a very, very impressive performance last week. He ran top 20 pretty much the whole entire race and at times was contending for a top 10 spot near the end of the event. Unfortunately, the car kind of fell off near the end of the race and dropped back quite a bit. He had the best finishing RSS car because while it is Viking Motorsports, his car still kind of falls under that RSS umbrella. It's just the Viking Motorsports partnership. Now, obviously, Matt Benedetto does want to run the whole entire season or rest of the year outside of the road courses and even Darlington as well. A little surprise considering Matty D has had some decent performances in Darlington in the past. Most surprised they're not going to be running that. But I think he did overall a really solid and good job. And I do think that Matt Benedetto deserves another chance and opportunity to go full-time with this team. Say what you want to say about the guy. He is a very talented race car driver. I know that he's kind of burned bridges with organizations and teams in the past. But certainly, I do think he deserves a chance and opportunity to run full-time once again. And I'm glad to see he's going to be running at least the next four races in Xfinity. I think he's going to do a really good job. And I think he's going to contend maybe for a top 20 this weekend. We know how strong that team has been in the past, especially Martinsville Speedway. He'll be looking to have a good run. Hopefully, he can have a solid run with the team. But again, he had a very good performance. He ran top 20 all race for the most part. was really good on the long run. And certainly, I think he could have a chance and opportunity to run great with the organization once again. So nonetheless, great performance from Matt Benedetto, and, and it's pretty cool to see that he spoke on that first performance with the team and organization. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about motorsports games. Now, it was reported by Mike Straw from Insider Gaming that according to him, that motorsports games gave the NASCAR license to iRacing for $6 million. We're going to talk about iRacing here in just a little bit, but definitely very interesting. We didn't know exactly how much motorsports games had paid out to NASCAR. Obviously, motorsports games had lost a NASCAR license at the end of last year. I think around September 30th to early October, it was announced that iRacing had picked up the NASCAR license. And there's expected to be a game at some point next year release from iRacing, which we'll talk about here in just a little bit. Obviously, Motorsports Games has been losing a lot of money. And actually, in their in business call that they had, they basically threw NASCAR under the bus, basically saying that we have a winning property with Lamar Ultimate, which is like, no, you guys completely shattered and screwed the game up. You made a terrible game. You made a terrible product. And that's the reason you guys lost the business. And you weren't making any games. And you basically were kind of like a Ponzi scheme. And you're still losing it. And you're expected to go into bankruptcy. You wanted to fill your pockets. Your old CEO basically had run another Ponzi scheme in the past and had been losing a lot of money. That's why you had to sell it because NASCAR was forcing you into lawsuits and you were getting into legal trouble. That's why you lost the business and that's why iRacing came in and forced you guys to lose it. 
I think that they are absolutely wrong with the way they're saying this stuff. And personally, I think that they absolutely deserve to lose the NASCAR license. Because again, they absolutely were messing with it. They weren't releasing a game. And the updates released were completely broken. They rushed it. They weren't paying their employees. And their employees were losing a ton of money. To me, I think that it's a little disappointing to see them throw NASCAR under the bus and even iRacing under the bus, even though they're the ones that should be thrown under the bus themselves because they couldn't release a really solid and great product. To me, they shouldn't be throwing NASCAR or any other property under the bus considering they're the ones who messed up and screwed up the games themselves. And now we're going to head on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Eric Amarol and Ryan Truex. As it was reported by Dustin Albino yesterday, that Eric Amarol, in fact, will be driving the 20 car this weekend at Martinsville as Eric Amarol will be competing for the Dash for Cash. Then for the next three weeks, Ryan Truex will be driving the 20 car at Texas next weekend. Then he's going to race at Talladega a few weeks down the road, and then he'll race at Dover. Let's start off Eric Amarola. Eric Amarola making his fourth schedule start of 15, around 15 races of 2024. He'll be looking to get his first Xfinity Series win of the season. Last week at Richmond, Eric Amarola had a very impressive and a really strong performance. And I think he absolutely is going to be a very big favorite. And he might be the favorite going into this week. And considering he's historically been really good at Martinsville. And the last time he ran there, he ran extremely impressive. Now let's focus on Ryan Truex. I circled that Dover race. He won the last time we were there, and that 20 car has been extremely fast and really, really quick in recent years. They were, And that 20 car won the last time we were at Texas Motor Speedway. So certainly, I think that Ryan Truex does have a few races circled. I know he's been trying to go full-time with this team for 2024, but I am excited to see that Ryan Truex is getting the chance and opportunity to drive with this team this weekend and the next, next couple of weekends. Obviously, going to run him and make a lot of starts this year. I think he's going to run a majority of the race in the 19 at the later portion of this year, though Taylor Gray does have a lot of races scheduled with the 19 team going forward considering Dasher Cash is coming up. Nonetheless, really excited for both those drivers. I think they're definitely going to make the best of it, and I think they certainly will do a really solid and good job with that organization. We'll see how they end up doing and see if they can perform really, really good. But trust me, I don't see them having issues or problems. I think they are going to do a really good job with that organization. And now we're going to head on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Justin Alexander. As it was announced yesterday afternoon that Justin Alexander is back crew chiefing for Austin Dillon and will be replacing Keith Rodden going forward starting this weekend at Martinsville Speedway. Justin Alexander has worked with Austin Dillon in the past. He worked at Austin Dillon from 2000, I believe, 16 or 17, up until 2020. And then he started working again, I think, from 2021 to 2022, but then took a little bit of a backseat role and has only crew chief once since then, crew chiefing for Brody Kosecki. And he basically is replacing Keith Rodden. These two, Justin Alexander and Austin Dillon, have worked together very, very well in the past. And all of the wins in the Cup Series that Alexander and Austin Dillon have had, have Austin, all of Austin Dillon's career wins, have come under the Justin Alexander work. So he's worked with him in the past, and they've had a lot of success. Let's talk about the guy that they're replacing, Keith Rodden. Say what you want to say about Austin Dillon is performance because a lot of people crap on Austin Dillon. But I think a lot of the reason that Austin Dillon has completely struggled in the last few years is because of Keith Rodden. I looked up Keith Rodden's stats, and in his NASCAR Cup Series career, I think he's only won one NASCAR Cup Series race, and that was with that was with uh, Casey came back in 2017 during the Brickyard 400. That is the only race that he ended up winning as a crew chief. Keith Rodden has not been able to get the best out of equipment. And I've said this for a long time, that he is one of the worst crew chiefs that I've ever seen grace a NASCAR Cup Series car. He's a decent engineer, but he's not a great crew chief. He struggled with Elliott Sadler back in the day, and he struggled with Casey Kane. Is one of the reasons that Casey Kane, at the end of his tenure at Hendrick Motorsports, did not go so well. To me, I think this is the right move to get Austin Dillon back on track. And apparently Austin Dillon was very pissed off on the radio with the strategy that they were having, and he was not very happy about it. And Richard, his grandpa, told him to calm down. But I think Austin Dillon had every right to be frustrated and upset. To me, if you're not performing as a crew chief, you need to be out and you need to move into another part of the team, which Keith Rodden is still going to remain with the team going forward. But I think this is the right move and right decision for them to do this, and I'm glad to see that they're making this move because they absolutely needed to make this this move for this team to get a lot better. I think this is the right decision and a good move to see Justin Alexander getting back in because this is what I think they needed to do for sure.
And now we're going to head on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Brad Keselowski in practice. Now, yesterday, NASCAR was doing mid-race availabilities for local media, and Brad Keselowski was in there, and Taylor Kitchen caught a video talking about more practice from Brad Keselowski. And Brad Keselowski says they're, they haven't really caught cuss when it comes to practice, and he's advocating that we need more practice for the NASCAR Cup Series. This is now the second or third team owner that has advocated for more practice. We have seen drivers like Dale Jr. also, who is an owner of Junior Motorsports, which we'll be talking about them later in this episode as well. He's also been advocating for more practice. Look, I think a lot of these team owners and these teams, they want more practice. And I absolutely agree with Brad Keselowski. I think that we need to see a little bit more practice. I'm not saying we need to go back to the days where we had two or three hours of practice. But my personal opinion is we get rid of the group sessions and you go down to one 50-minute practice session. You do qualifying like the Xfinity Series. You could do the rounds if you want to, but personally, I think the group sessions need to go away too. You need to have a normal qualifying session where everyone goes in from where they are in owner's points. Yes, it might give some drivers an advantage on the, on later in the sessions, but I personally do believe that we should be going off of owner's points when it comes to that and not this group metric system that we've been doing. Yes, it could definitely be entertaining for sure, but personally, I think qualifying just needs to go back to being simple. You don't need everything to be a show. We need to see more practice every single week, in my opinion, and I think for the sport to grow, I really hope they do end up doing that because, and maybe that's something we get with the new deal coming in. Maybe next year they add a little more practice because obviously Amazon's coming in, a couple other companies are coming in, so maybe that ends up happening. But I think drivers also need it for development. I think drivers like Kyle Busch struggle because of the lack of practice to me. This is a no-brainer. NASCAR absolutely 100% needs to go ahead and add a little bit more practice for the teams. And now we're going to head up on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about the Richmond TV ratings. Now, it was reported by Adam Stern yesterday that Fox got 3.31 million viewers for Sunday night's NASCAR Cup Series race at Richmond. Last year's spring race was on FS1, so there's no direct year-over-year comparison. But according to Jonathan Field, apparently last year's Bristol Dirt Race had around 3.5 million viewers. And the last race that happened on Fox two years ago, that was 3.9 million viewers. Which means that more than likely the Richmond Easter race was down. This is the first race outside of the Daytona 500 that has been down. And remember, Daytona 500 was rain delayed. So this is the first race that's ran on its scheduled time this year that has been down a little bit. Now, why could the ratings be down for this week? Well, one, Easter, a lot of people are probably not watching TV as much. Two, short track races generally, when it comes to TV, don't do fantastic in the ratings department. Three, there was a little bit of a delay at the start. There was about a 15-minute delay, and while the race did basically get started almost on time, you did have those long cautions that sadly affected it. That's one of the reasons why I think the ratings are down a little bit. But two, Richmond Raceway does not always get the best in TV ratings. I know I mentioned a little bit ago that basically Richmond a couple years ago by 3.9 million viewers, but even during NASCAR's peak era back in like 2008, 2009, back in 05, races like at Richmond, at Martinsville, and even Bristol did not always get the best in TV ratings because short because it is a smaller market, even though Richmond is big, that is a smaller market. And that's why I think, sadly, the ratings were down definitely a little bit. But again, you did have the delays. You had the racing not being as exciting. And I think less people tuned in the race because of that. Because Richard is, let's be honest, is not the most exciting race every single week. Which is why I also believe the ratings are down a little bit. It is disappointing for sure to see the ratings go down, at least for once. But the sport is still up on the races that have been scheduled. And I, do, I don't think they're going to be up this week because they are on FS1 for the first time this week. So it's probably going to be less viewership. Hopefully I'm wrong and we do get some good viewership. But I'm not expecting much this weekend. Nonetheless, a little disappointing to see the ratings are down. But I'm going to be real. I'm not really shocked or not surprised by this. See, the ratings are down. Considering the fact I kind of expected that they were going to be unfortunately down. I kind of expected it. I'm not really shocked or surprised by this, to be honest with you. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about iRacing. As iRacing announced this morning that the NASCAR game, it looks like, has finally announced when it's going to be coming out. And iRacing has announced that the NASCAR game is expected to be released in the fall 
of 2025. They said that our team's getting back into work and the NASCAR game is going to be called NASCAR 25, coming out in the fall of 2025. They did not confirm an exact date, but my expectation is it'll be sometime in late September or early October is when they are going to be releasing the game. And not earlier in the year, like some people have been speculating, they might end up doing. This does not shock me or surprise me to see that the game more than likely is going to be coming out later. Because honestly, even though I think a lot of people want the game to come out a little earlier in the year, and I think it'd be really good for the sport to come out a little earlier in the year, I would rather wait until the end of next year, especially for the game to get done a lot more. Because we want this game to at least be good enough to play. They obviously have been focusing on this game for the last year or so, and they're going to have a couple years of development to get it done. They're not under scrutiny from NASCAR to get a game out like this year. They're going to have a little more time to get this game released. The hope is this game at least is playable and is not a game that's not going to be unplayable like the Motorsports Games ones were and sometimes even the 704 games that were released from Monster, which Monster, by the way, is involved, but iRacing is working with it. And iRacing absolutely cares about making a really, really good product. I am excited for this, though, and I definitely will be playing it for sure once it does come out. Now, granted, we should all wait for some reviews to come out as well and see if people do definitely enjoy it. But I do trust iRacing a lot more because iRacing is a very respected brand. And they've had a really strong and great product. They've also built the World of Outlaws game. And that was basically for in the SRX games. And from what I've heard, the SRX game and the World of Outlaws game, a lot of people really, really enjoyed those games. So it does get me excited for the game coming out in the fall of 2025. I'm excited for this, and I'm again, I'm really looking forward to this game being released. I love what iRacing has been able to do over the years, and I certainly do believe that they're going to release a good product. I think Dale Jr. hopefully will get involved to make sure that game goes out smoothly as well. A game could be the big thing that gets in that key 18 to 34 demographic, especially because that's the goal for NASCAR, trying to get that younger demographic for the sport to grow. We've been growing a little bit in that demographic recently, but I think another big thing that can transcend that is a really good game, and it looks like it'll be coming out sometime in the fall of 2025. And again, I'm very excited about that. I'm glad to see that it looks like it'll be coming out in the fall of 2025. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Richmond Raceway. Now, it was reported by Jordan Bianchi on the Terrida that it sounds like Richmond will likely lose a race in 2025 as NASCAR is going to be looking to expand potentially to a different country or a different racetrack in 2025. While this is a little disappointing for a lot of people that are from the Richmond area, and I've seen some people from Richmond defending it, this does not shock me or surprise me, sadly. Here's why I'm not really shocked or surprised by this news. Let's be honest with ourselves. Richmond Raceway, in my personal opinion, has probably been my least favorite short track in NASCAR. I think Marsville and Bristol put on a much better racing product overall. When is the last time a Richmond race was absolutely exciting from start to finish? 2014 and when was the last race that well the university plays was 2014 and what's the last race that a lot of people goes goes back to that they really enjoy 2016 when Carl Edwards got into the back bumper of Kyle Busch at the end of the race Richmond ever since they got rid of the sealer years ago I think the racing has generally suffered and people can say oh it's just the next gen car that's making racing not as good because the strategy racing can be fun and I do agree that the strategy racing to an extent is absolutely fun to watch there is no denying that but you have to look at the attendance as well the attendance for Richmond has been a big issue and there's no secret that Richmond almost lost a date for 2024 so it looks like they're going to lose a day in 2025 now where is that date going to go to well more than likely it's either going to go to montreal in 2025 or it's going to go to mexico there's been a lot of chatter conversations that nascar is trying to expand outside of the united states in 2025 they came very close to expanding for 2024 out to Montreal, but obviously, sadly, that fell through. So they weren't going to go to Montreal in 2024 because the date they originally planned was around that June 9th date, and F1 moved the Montreal race to June 9th, the Canadian Grand Prix, which is where NASCAR had originally scheduled for the race to take place. And then you talk about Mexico. There's a lot of talk of the clash could go to Mexico, but there's also a lot of talk that that date could come from Montreal. It is going to be very interesting to see how things play out on that front. But again, I am not shocked or surprised to see 
that they're basically likely going to be losing a day. Richmond, in my opinion, is just a racetrack. And you, and you think about other racetracks as well. You've got Darlington. It's probably not going to lose a day. I know that spring day could be gone in the future for another track in the future because ISC owns it. But you don't have a lot of ISC tracks that have two days. I think Phoenix deserves to lose a day, but I don't know if they're going to going to. Kansas has some attendance issues, so they could lose a day. But I think Richmond is going to be the first track that goes on the chopping block. And I think that's going to go to the international track. And if you want my personal prediction, I think more than likely that will go probably to Canada. I think Montreal will likely be the date that ends up picking up the Richmond day because they want to go up to Canada and Circuit Jills Villeneuve. And I think the racing, no offense to Richmond, I think the racing at Circuit Jills Villeneuve more than likely is going to be a little bit more exciting at that race. That's my opinion though, but it looks like Richmond is going to lose a day, which I think is really unfortunate, definitely for sure. But I think at the same token, same time, Richmond just doesn't have the attendance. People didn't show up. And usually the TV ratings, like I mentioned earlier, are not very good for Richmond Sanders. So as much as it's disappointing to see, it is not a major shock and surprise overall to see that it looks like Richmond more than likely is going to lose the date in 2025, which isn't a shock or surprise, to be honest with you. And now we're going to hedge on to the next story of today's episode as we're talking about Denny Hamlin and the jump restart. Now, there has been a lot of conversation around this jump restart at the end of the Cup Series race. On the final restart with two laps to go, Denny Hamlin rolls into the restart. Now, you are not supposed to go past that restart box in that restart zone until you get to the white line, the first white line. Once you get to that first white line, you can go whenever you want to in that restart zone. But since then, Denny Hamlin had gone a little bit before then. Now, Denny Hamlin definitely joked a little bit about jumping the race start. But then last night, after all the talk had been going around, he said, can we get some paint schemes revealed and some big news come out like iRacing news? Because it's getting old at this point talking about this jumped race start. Now, NASCAR, Ben Elton Sawyer, who does a lot of the competition stuff for NASCAR, he went on Sirius and NASCAR Radio to discuss this. And he definitely said... Dallin Sawyer says that Denny Hamlin absolutely rolled early into the restart zone and went too quickly. But then NASCAR also stated that if this was on lap 5, lap 10, or even lap 300, it would have been officiated a little differently. To me, that doesn't make any sense. I'll give NASCAR credit on one thing. They absolutely, I will appreciate them for admitting that Denny Hamill jumped the race because Denny Hamill, there is no doubt in my mind that he jumped that race arc. Everybody knows, even Ellen Sawyer knows, that he rolled because even rolling before, you're still jumping the race arc. Now, I will agree with most people that Denny Hamlin probably wins that race anyways, even if he jumped, doesn't jump the restart, because Denny Hamlin was in the control position. I don't think Mark Trick Jr. was going to get by Denny Hamlin. I just don't think it was going to happen. And Denny Hamlin definitely did win the race from pit row, because the picker did their job. So he's not wrong on that front. But at the same token, same time, you've got to enforce the rules. And you go back to last week at Circuit of the Americas, where we were penalizing drivers for cutting a single corner. And Jane Van Gisbergen got a 30-second penalty at the end of the race for cutting this much. So you're going to penalize these guys one week, but you're not going to penalize these guys for jumping a race start, which is a clear violation, while you have very, very certain rules for cutting a corner at Circuit of the Americas in one section of a racetrack, but a clear restart box has been there for the last two years. You're going to go differently? That just doesn't make any sense to me. It kind of turned blind eye into that, and I think they made a major, major mistake, and NASCAR's officiating has been very inconsistent. I saw Joe Logano call out NASCAR as well last night, which I think he's absolutely right, by the way, of being frustrated about it, because if Joe Logano was the one who did that, and he does it the next week, when we go to Mars this week, and he goes before, are they going to penalize him? That would be NASCAR's big issue, because NASCAR has been always had a major problem with being consistent. They have always been consistently inconsistent when it comes to their rulings. And I think NASCAR needs to get it together. They've had bad officiating for a very, very long time. I thought they'd been getting better, but they had that bad call for Haley Deegan when she went up the racetrack at Phoenix where she didn't even hit the wall, mind you. She just went up the racetrack and never scraped the wall, and they were wondering why a caution was thrown and affected the outcome of the race. They did that a couple times. They did that with Kyle Busch caution, and the officiating just needs to absolutely get a lot better than it is at the moment. Because I think what they've been doing is really, really ridiculous. To me, officiating needs to get better. 
And I really hope it does get better going forward because what we've been seeing recently is just not acceptable and it needs to get better going forward because what we've been seeing recently is not good in my opinion. I hope it gets better, but I am worried that it's not going to get better and that really, really worries me going forward that NASCAR's officiating is sadly not going to get better and that definitely concerns me quite a bit in my honest opinion. And now we're going ahead and jump on to the next major story of today's episode as we're talking about the NASCAR schedule for 2025. Now, Chris Myers, who works at Fox Sports and is on NASCAR on Fox, put out a tweet yesterday, and this got a little bit of conversation. We've already talked about the fact that Richmond likely will probably lose a day in 2025, but he also notes that he is not expecting NASCAR to race on Easter after the TV ratings came out. He also says that there will be no LA Coliseum race, but there is expected to be a Southern California race in the not-so-distant future announced for 2025. Let's first begin with the no Easter race. This is what I will say about NASCAR. A lot of people were really complaining about NASCAR racing on Easter. Even Dale Jr. kind of talked about that on the Dale Jr. download recently, one day episode before the next one that is going to be coming out, I think, later today. Look, I think racing on Easter, I really personally don't have a problem with it. And here's why I really don't have a problem. I know a lot of industry people do have a problem with it. But personally, I think we should be racing on Easter. And I think that if we are going to race on Easter, we need to do it at a racetrack that is closer. Which I think that leads to a track like North Wilkesboro. There were a lot of rumors last year that North Wilkesboro was going to host the Easter race for 2024. But they ended up hosting the All-Star race and that went to Richmond. I just don't think Richmond is the most exciting track. And say what you want to say about North Wilkesboro. North Wilkesboro is a lot closer to the Charlotte Hub. I did a little bit of research, and I think North Wilkesboro is only about 75 miles away from Charlotte, North Carolina, where Charlotte Motor Speedway is, which is where a lot of the teams are from. Teams would not have to take as much time to travel to the racetrack, and they can go home at night, and they wouldn't have to do as much travel getting into the track than like going to Richmond, which is a few hours away. I think that they absolutely need to have, if they're going to have an Easter race next year, it needs to be at North Wilkesboro in 2025 because North Wilkesboro, personally to me, needs to be hosting a points paying race in 2025. Now let's get to the other side of things. No LA Coliseum. This does not shock me. 2023 was the final year of the contract. They had the issues with the weather, obviously, and no one really showed up because obviously there was a last minute notice, but attendance wasn't going to be great anyways for the final LA Coliseum event. NASCAR's ran its course at that track, and unless they want to go back there again, it doesn't sound like they're going to be racing LA Coliseum, but he mentions a Southern California track as a potential possibility. This is definitely very, very interesting. Obviously, NASCAR, I think, really wants to race in Southern California in 2025. But like I mentioned, it doesn't sound like it's going to be at the Los Angeles Coliseum. So where could they race if they don't race at the LA Coliseum? Well, there are some options. You do have a rumor of Dodger Stadium coming into play, but I don't know if that's going to end up happening. Dodger Stadium has been mentioned they could race out of the parking lot or they could race inside the stadium. But is NASCAR going to want to take that leap and chance? I don't really know if they're going to want to do that, to be honest. You've also got possibility of Long Beach. There was a lot of talk that NASCAR had been looking to buy into Long Beach, but Jerry Forsyth has basically said that NASCAR needs to look elsewhere if they're going to race at Long Beach because Jerry Forsyth now owns a complete ride to Long Beach. So that could be a possibility, but I'm not expecting that. They could go to Irwindale. That is certainly a possibility they could go to Irwindale. They could have a street race in Los Angeles. That could be a possibility as well. There's not a lot of options available, and until they get the Auto Club track done, which we know for a fact is not going to be done till at least 2024. We at least know right now for sure that Auto Club is not going to be done at least till 2026, and they're still working on the track. They haven't done any construction. They've got to get that done before they race in Southern California again. So I don't know what's going to happen in the future for Southern California, but I certainly do believe we're going to be racing there next year. NASCAR wants to go there really, really badly. Um, They could could go back to LA Coliseum, but Chris Myers, like I said, is saying they're not going to be going back to LA Coliseum. So I really don't know at this point what NASCAR is going to decide to go ahead and do. It's going to be very interesting to see what happens, to see what NASCAR does decide to do. In fact, we'll see what ends up happening, see if NASCAR does decide to go ahead and and race in Southern California, where I'll be find out in the not-so-distant future.
And now we're going ahead jump on to the final major story of today's episode as we're talking about Stuart Haas Racing. Now, we have talked a lot about Stuart Haas Racing on this channel over the course of the last few weeks. The reason is because Stuart Haas Racing's team has continued to be brought up in regards to potentially switching manufacturers and potentially losing charters. And according to Adam Stern yesterday, the possibility of SHR selling charters before 2025 has become a hot topic in the NASCAR garage in recent weeks, according to more than half a dozen industry executives familiar with the matter. Now, we'll talk about the teams that are speculated here in just a little bit, but obviously there has been a lot of talk conversations that Stuart Haas Racing could be downsizing their program in the NASCAR Cup Series in 2025. Now, the reason being is because right now they are required with the current Ford deal they have, they're required to have four cars competing on the racetrack at all times. But here is the problem. Their deal with Ford is still not done on a new contract. And if they do lose their Tier 1 Ford deal, they're going to have no option or no choice but to go ahead and downsize that program. They're going to have to go and do that. And that's where the questions roll in. Who could be out of Stuart Haas Racing if they do, in fact, end up selling a charter? Well, I think that there's a couple options. The first driver that could go is possibly Chase Briscoe. And I mentioned Chase Briscoe if they do end up leaving Ford and they go to Chevrolet. Because Chase Briscoe has been a Ford driver basically his whole entire racing career. So Chase Briscoe would have to probably be let go if he's under contract with Ford. Now, he can obviously break that contract and stay with Stuart Haas Racing. But to be fair, Chase Briscoe has been a really strong and great performer with Stuart Haas Racing. So he could break that contract with Ford, for instance, and go with SHR if they were to leave a manufacturer. Because I think Chase Briscoe's done a solid job with SHR, and I think he is a good driver. He hasn't lived up to the hype he got in Xfinity, but I still think he's done a very solid and good job. Then you have Noah Gregson. Noah Gregson, in my opinion, has probably been the most consistent, has had a lot of speed with Stuart Haas Racing so far, which I think a lot of people have been shocked and surprised. And he has been able to bring a lot of sponsorship and funding to the table with Bass Pro Shops, Overstock, True Timber, Black Rifle Coffee. All those companies have been working with Noah Gregson this year. And like I said, Noah Gregson's been having some pretty good speed to start 2024. He's been in the top 15 and 20, even some top 10 so far this season. You then got, of course, uh, Josh Berry, who's been full-time rookie this year. He's a little older, but Josh Berry, I think, has also had some pretty good speed, especially on the short tracks. He's been absolutely running really strong on the short tracks this year. So I don't know if he's going to be let go, and Rodney Childers will probably end up going if Josh Berry leaves. And then you have Ryan Priest. Ryan Priest, I like the guy a lot, and to be fair, if not for the 35-point penalty that he got, he right now would be sitting 23rd in the standings and 23rd in the points. So he would be in a pretty solid and good position. So I don't know if Ryan Priest would be the one that would be absolutely go, but I think he's the most likely on the hot seat to go. If you were to make a little prediction, if Stuart Haas Racing does stay with Ford, but they downsize. I think Ryan Priest will be the one on the chopping block. He's been the least informing driver on the team. Noah Grayson's a, a, his first year with SHR. And then Josh Priest in his first year with SHR. I don't think that they're going to drop those two guys. And Ryan Chills will probably go if Josh Berry left. And Chase Briscoe has been the franchise driver. But if Sue Ross Racing does, in fact, end up leaving, they probably are, if they end up leaving, I would expect that probably jo that it would be Chase Briscoe going to another organization like the Wood Brothers, maybe, perhaps, because it is a Ford organization and team. They lost a lot of funding and sponsorship, right? That's why they're probably also looking to lose a charter. They could have had a drivers like Kyle Larson, Kyle Busch, even Haley Deegan, Matt Benedetto go there, but obviously that did not end up happening. Michael McDowell, Zane Smith, all those drivers have not been available to go to SHR. They need someone to bring in sponsorship funding, and they really don't have that right now. And especially if they do downsize and they lose their Tier 1 Ford support, and they switch a manufacturer, they're not going to have that opportunity there. So I think Sewer Haas Racing is definitely going to downsize at the end of this year because I think they're going to be one of the big sellers. They've been one of the teams that have been mentioned for a while, and I think there's a really good chance they do, in fact, downsize. Now, those are the teams that could down that could be one of the organizations. What are the four teams that are looking to pick up the charters? Well, there's four organizations. You have Trackhouse Racing, 2311, Legacy Motor Club, and Junior Motorsports. Trackhouse does not shock me. Trackhouse, they want to expand. They right now have two cars available in the Cup Series, and they have four or five drivers that are currently under contract 
with the organization. You've got Dale Soares driving the 99 car. You've got Ross Chastain in the one. Ross Chastain is not going anywhere anytime soon. He's under a long-term deal, and he's bringing a sponsorship from Bush. He's not going anywhere anytime soon. Daniel Suarez is the contract year for him, but he just won the most recent race at Atlanta Motor Speedway a couple weeks ago. And while he's been struggling a little bit in performance, Daniel Suarez has some decent speed to start this year. But he needs to pick up the pace because I think that win might not save him, unfortunately. You then got Shane Van Gisbergen. Shane wants to move up to the NASCAR Cup Series full-time next year, and he's been doing a really good job in the Xfinity Series so far for the Sanders. He's finished in the top 20 in all but two of the races so far, and is basically right now in the playoffs. If I'm not mistaken, he's currently in the playoffs right now after pretty solid performance. I think he's like 8 to 10 points above the cutoff line currently at the moment in this particular time. Actually, one or two points back, but he's still really, really close to getting back into the playoffs. And then, of course, you have Zane Smith, who's under contract with Trackhouse as well. He could move up as well to full-time Trackhouse entry and then get a charter maybe from Colleague as well. And then, of course, you have Connor Zillich, but I think more than likely he's going to go full-time Xfinity. They're going to need a charter for all these drivers available. And then you also have 2311 Racing. They're another organization that absolutely wants to expand. It's no secret. Now, they're waiting for the charter market to get down and the price maybe to drop a little bit, but they want to have three to four full-time cars. Denny Hamlin has mentioned recently he might want to drive for his own organization part-time. And you've also, of course, have other drivers like Corey High moving up to the ranks, Chandler Smith moving up to the ranks, and even if Kurt Busch wanted to come back, maybe you could have him as a possible driver that could get behind the wheel. So that certainly could be a possibility there. Even Carl Edwards, who want to come out of retirement, maybe he drives the organization, but more than likely, Corey Hunt. One of the teams that shocked me is Legacy Motor Club. Legacy Motor Club has two full-time drivers, but they do have a third car they run for Jimmy Johnson. And there's also Corey Heim as well. Corey Heim is also a reserve driver for Legacy Motor Club, is doing sim work with Legacy Motor Club as well. So certainly, Legacy Motor Club would like to probably expand to give Corey Heim a chance and opportunity. I don't think Joe Gibbs Racing wants Corey Heim, and granted, Corey could go to one of the legacy cars if they make some moves and Mark Trick Jr. does retire. But Corey Heim, in my opinion, is absolutely ready to go Cup Series racing. So that certainly could be a possibility, and even Sheldon Creed could be a possibility if Legacy Motor Club does decide they want to expand. They're building up their program. They seem to have a little more speed this year than they did last year at this point. So certainly that could be a possibility. And then the final team is Junior Motorsports. Junior Motorsports always gets mentioned in the silly season news. Their team always gets brought up in the conversations because they've always talked about wanting to go Cup Series racing over the last couple of years. Now, obviously, Dale Jr. has not made the move at this point to go Cup Series racing because it is required that you're going to need a charter to move up full time. And charters right now are worth 40 to $50 million. Now, could Junior Motorsports possibly partner up with an organization and team? That certainly is a possibility of something happening for sure. But I think that they're going to need definitely a charter for that to end up happening. To me, I think that there is going to be some movement that happens there. And I do think Junior Motorsports could be one of those organizations that does end up getting a charter. I've been predicting for the last years that I think that they are going to move up in the next year or so. But again, charters are going to be required for that to end up happening. But again, they could get a charter from Stuart Haas Racing. They could get a charter from Colin. And I think Junior Motorsports would be really good for the sport. They could get a driver like a Matt to Benedetto, perhaps, to drive behind the wheel and get a start up there. They could get Roger Kroof moving up. They could move Sammy Smith up, perhaps. Kyle Weatherman, perhaps, could be a driver they could get. They can move someone into that Junior Motorsports pipeline and start that Cup Series organization and team. And I think they would be a very successful team and organization and Cup. So I think Junior Motorsports is a team to definitely watch for as well when it comes to it. If you want my early prediction, though, I think either track us or 2311 Racing might end up getting the charter. But I think Junior Motorsports is definitely going to be a sleeper pick. We'll see what happens in regards to that and see what the team decides to do. Nonetheless, so I do think that there is going to be some movement for Sewer Haas Racing. And I do certainly believe that they are going to sell a charter at the end of this season. So, that is going to be today's NASCAR news and motorsports news video. I want to thank you guys for watching. Please like subscribe to the channel. The location is on. So, if I win a video, that does go live on my channel. Follow me on Facebook and Instagram as we're on Patreon as well. Link's description below with that and comment your thoughts below on today's video. Who do you think is picking up the trial from Stuart Haas Racing? Let me your thoughts in the comments below if Stuart Haas Racing does decide to downsize. To later today on the channel of the NASCAR Xfinity Series race picks for the upcoming race in Martinsville. Then tomorrow we're going to have the NASCAR Cup Series race picks for Martinsville in the paint scheme video. Friday we'll probably have a NASCAR news video. And we'll also have the truck series race review as well for Martinsville. 
So anyways, like I said, I want to thank you guys for watching today's episode, and I'll see you guys next time for more great, awesome NASCAR content and other motorsports content on the channel like this. Take care, everybody.